Marinero, the sick podcast, CF Montreal talk on this Thursday, October 26th. It is 2 p.m. We are live from Playground in Ganawage. I absolutely love this place. Once you try it, you won't go anywhere else. Every time I come here, they feed me, they hug me, they love me. I'm better off here than I am at home, but that's another story for another day. Live, the WPT Global, Global October Millions event is taking place, which ends on Monday. So this place is absolutely jam-packed right now. As a matter of fact, I see a couple of my buddies, one of which is Fabio Luongo, Roberto's brother. It was nice to see Fabio. And I'm sure it's going to be very nice to see my buddy, Jeremy Filosa. He's coming up in about a minute right here on the Sick Podcast. Turn up your volume, because you're about to listen to The Sick Podcast, CF Montreal Talk. Here's the chance, here's the chance, they've got the goal, absolutely incredible, Cameron Porter delivers the goal to send Montreal Impact into the CONCACAF Champions League semi-final. The sickest CF Montreal Podcast. It's going to be sick. Sick, sick, sick. So let's get right into it right away. It was yesterday morning at 11.21 a.m. that a tweet was sent out from Jeremy Filosa of 98.5 FM and EMFC Radio. It was probably about 11 hours earlier that EMFC Radio sent out a tweet basically saying that after six years of having that podcast covering CF Montreal pretty much on a daily basis, better than anyone else has ever done it in the history of sports reporting here in the city of Montreal and in the province of Quebec, that they were ceasing operations. They came to the conclusion that they were not going to do it anymore for various reasons. 11 hours later, this tweet from one of their members and one of their hosts, Jeremy Filosa. Des nouvelles de ma part. News on my behalf. J'ai passé une incroyable année à décrire des matchs de soccer cet été sur les zones de Apple. 14 matchs de Vancouver. I had an incredible year this summer of doing play-by-play for Vancouver Whitecaps games on Apple TV I worked 14 games. Malheureusement, j'ai été informé en début de semaine que je ne serai pas de retour l'an prochain. Unfortunately, I was informed early in the week that I would not be back next season. No. Mes patrons à la télé no. étaient plus que satisfaits de mon travail. Impeccable a été le mot utilisé lors de notre conversation. My bosses with Apple were more than satisfied with my work. Impeccable was the last word that they used during our conversation. Mais des opinions et des propos parfois sévères partagés sur les médias sociaux n'ont pas plu à certaines personnes et ont été rapportés et utilisés pour influencer mes patrons aux États-Unis à prendre ces décisions. But my opinions, sometimes severe, shared on my social media, didn't sit well with several people and were used to influence my bosses in the United States to take this decision. Cela a eu un impact direct sur la suite des choses. Je suis extrêmement attristé par la perte de cet emploi Même s'il n'était qu'à temps partiel, j'y tenais absolument. This had a direct impact on what was to follow. I'm very saddened by losing this job. Even though it was a part-time job for now, I really wanted it. Merci à certains membres des médias qui ont montré un geste de solidarité envers moi Et la liberté d'expression est celle des médias cette semaine. Thank you to several members of the media 
who in solidarity did not show up to the year end presser in support of myself and free speech. C'est ce qui met un terme à la couverture quotidienne du soccer pour moi. Ce sera mieux pour tout le monde ainsi. This will bring an end to me covering soccer. It'll be better for everyone this way. Sachez que je serai toujours au rendez-vous pour vous parler de sport et peut-être aussi occasionnellement de soccer au 98.5 FM comme je le fais depuis maintenant presque 20 ans. Please know that I will always be available to talk sports and maybe from time to time even soccer on 98.5 FM radio the way I've been doing so for over 20 years. Merci à tous les auditeurs, lecteurs et passionnés de sport. Thank you to all the viewers, all the listeners, and all the passionate sports fans. La vie continue. À bientôt. Life goes on. See you soon. I'm going to see him right now. Jeremy. Tony. Thanks for taking the time. I appreciate it, my man. Uh, How do you like I, the kitchen? The kitchen is beautiful. I was, um, in all transparency, I was one of the first ones aware when this happened because you contacted me and you told me. So for those watching right now, give us, if you can, a timeline of when you touch base with the people at Apple or MLS Season Pass, what they told you, and when you knew for certain that you would not be returning as play-by-play -play man for Vancouver Whitecaps games on Apple TV next season? Um, listen, I, I contacted them uh, last week uh, just to start touching base on, uh, you know, what the plan was for next season. Um, and I received an email that was a little bit alarming. Um, and so I got a phone call from my boss um, telling me that, Um, they were not going to be able to retain my services. Uh, they told me straightforward that this had nothing to do with my work, that they thought my, my work was of excellent quality, was A1 all, all the way. Uh, but they had received messages uh, that I had shared on social media uh, that they thought were extremely harsh or too harsh um, concerning, obviously, uh, how things have been going here in Montreal with the team. And that for them, um, it, it, um, it, it was not possible for them to continue with me. Um, and obviously, I pleaded for my job. I tried to see if there was a conversation that could be had. Uh, they told me that there was not, unfortunately. And so, uh, yeah, it's been, it's, been, uh, it's been a shock ever since. It's been uh, extremely hurtful because I was passionate about the work I did there. I absolutely gave it everything during every second that I spent on air at Apple TV. I was only assigned to work Vancouver Whitecaps games, which was fine by me. Um, but I saw myself doing that for a long time. I thought I did the best I possibly could to get people on social media to jump on board uh, with MLS Season Pass and Apple. Um, but The work that I do on the side, which is on the weekdays, which doesn't really have anything to do with the commenting that I do on Apple TV or the play-by-play, -play, uh, was a problem uh, for some people. Especially since you're covering one team in terms of the play-by-play, -play, but your work as a reporter during the week is to talk about the Montreal sports landscape and consequently CF Montreal, of course. Right. Um, Based on the information I've been given, based on what I've been told, the one tweet that bothered some was a tweet that you sent out that basically talked about the chain of events, missed opportunities, dropping of the ball, some somewhat embarrassing that happened over the course of the season yeah Is that correct? Um, yeah i mean if you noticed uh that tweet went out and it was uh 
said to me in the middle of the conversation that that tweet was a problem and I deleted it. Um, in the middle of the conversation I was having with my boss. Um, but, and, and I understand that it's, it's harsh for the league or for a team, for somebody to put that out there in that way. I, actually, I think you did the same on your show last week. Um, and if I had said anything that was not accurate, um, I would have certainly uh, taken that upon my shoulders. But I think everything that was mentioned uh, was truthful. And starting with that, um, you know, I, I think that losing a job for being truthful, maybe harsh, but truthful, is, uh, is tough. Were there comments that you made on the sick podcast that caused a problem as well? Yes. Yes. Um, you know, when I said that, you know, we have to stop with the excuses and, you know, things needed to change, that was a problem also. Um, and I didn't say it in that tone. It's true. It wasn't uh, in the middle of a rant. I think I, I had two rants this year. Can that I was give one the, of uh, Can I, will you allow me to give the context? So we uh, were, sure. working, were working a show. It was you. It was myself. And it was Sofian Benzaza, Puskus Piri Piri. Uh, Sofian started talking about the fact that, you know, one of the reasons why they came up short is because they started their season with three games on the road and played five of their first six games on the road. We know what happened in those games on the road. Um, they lost 2 nothing, one nothing, 2 nothing. They came back to play their first game at home at Olympic Stadium. They won 3-2. And then they went back on the road for two more games. They lost 5 nothing and 4 nothing. It is a tough way to start the season. Your point is, and your point was, why do they start every season on the road for five of their first six? Because their field is not ready to play games early on in late February or early March because of the weather. But if they would have heating underneath their grass, the way you'll find in Toronto and in other markets, at that point, you don't have to worry about that. You can start your season at home. So basically, you said enough of the excuses, enough of the excuses. You said BS a couple of times, and then you said, I'm fed up. I can't take it anymore. You obviously said it very, very upset because you keep hearing over and over again that a big reason why they failed to make the play in is because they started the year on the road. And all you were trying to say was, you spend a little bit of money and you don't have to worry about that. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously it's a recurring problem that we know has been there for a long time. And I, I think we fans have been patient. Everybody's been patient. And it's a problem that has not been resolved and it keeps coming back. So, Jeremy, I've seen everything that you put on social media in the last 24 hours. A tweet, by the way when you talked about what happened, that tweet that we just read that has generated up until now, 678,000 views. I've seen you go on different radio stations, different radio shows, notably at 98.5 with Patrick Lagasse and with Mario Langlois. You went on TV Aspar with Jean-Charles Lajoie, and I know you're gonna go on other shows in the next couple of days. On some occasions, You've said people can draw their own conclusions where this is coming from. And I saw earlier this morning in the Journal de Montréal that I believe you said with Pat Legacy that it comes from CF Montreal. If you can tell us a little bit more on that and just a little bit more clarity. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit, um, you know, I want to I weigh my words here because when the information was given to me, um, sorry, to, sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah. So, you know, when the information was given me, to me, it was coming in so fast. And yes, that's what I understood. Uh, now, um, like I said, I was just so confused at the time that I just want to make 100% sure. So it was told to me, the communications department sent me this. So when I, I hear that, I'm thinking Montreal's communication department. Did they mean another communication department? I don't know. Listen, I'm going to let people draw their own conclusions on this. 
I didn't have any issues with the league. I didn't have any issues with Vancouver. You, you know, you can contact the media relations guy there. It was a fantastic season that we had together. Um, what I'm saying is, you know, I, you know, I'm not criticizing the Vancouver organization because things are running smoothly there. So, and and I praise them for everything that they've done this year because they've done a fantastic job, and that's what I do. When it's good, I'm going to tell you from A to Z, and I'll be the first one in front of the parade telling people how great this was and how things have worked out fantastic. But when it's not going well, I got to also say it. And I'm not saying it out of pleasure. I'm saying it because I want things to change and I want things to improve. That's, that's the only reason and that's the only point. And yeah, I'm paying the price for it right now. It hurts. Okay. So this is what we know. There's a tweet that you sent out talking about all the hiccups from CF Montreal in 2023. And there's comments you made on the sick podcast that upset the team. And then you find out that you're not going to be back. Right. I know that you've been upset for quite some time. I understand why you've been upset for quite some time. I'm going to say this. I don't know who did this to you specifically. I've been in the business long enough to be able to draw my own conclusions. I will say this, and I understand you being upset, that your podcast, which you said yesterday, will be ceasing operations, put in a request for interviews with the team going back a couple of months. And you followed up because you never heard back or it wasn't granted and you followed up and you followed up. And when your podcast followed up, you were told that you were not getting interviews. What don't you understand? You are way too negative. I shortly found out thereafter that with certain members of the organization, um, the relationship with you was going downhill fast. And as a matter of fact, you were pretty much persona non grata. And that's what I was told. Once again, whoever is behind this, they know. The people at MLS know. The people at Apple know. Now, I do know that Dan Courtemanche of Communications of the MLS uh, sent a text, an email, and contacted some members of the Montreal media yesterday to let them know that no team was going to influence who was going to be on and who was going to be back. Mind you, what we heard going into the season when it was announced who was going to be working with who and who was going to be doing what, we heard that they were suggestions from the clubs or the club. Yeah. I mean, I, I, mean, I don't. You know, I don't think that they would make those kinds of decisions without consulting the clubs. Uh, I don't know. But, you know, I, I would have appreciated a, an email from Dan. I've known Dan for a long time. He contacted many media members yesterday to try and downplay the situation. I think it would have been a better idea to maybe to reach out to me, have a discussion. Maybe cooler heads could have prevailed and still how can. Did Dan get every, how did Dan get everyone's number? I don't know. <laughs> Even people that don't follow the team <laughs> all of a sudden. But, you know, uh, like I said, I've known Dan for a long time. I, I would have appreciated a phone call. I would have appreciated to have a discussion. Um, you know, I'd like to be able to put this behind us and say that cooler heads have prevailed and for them to also show that they understand the importance of free press and that it's important for people to speak the truth. Um, when covering the league and at the end of the day you know I think they would come out bigger stronger that way but you know this is what I'd love hand. to see this is what I'd love to see um, I'd love to see CF Montreal come out with a tweet press release saying that the tweet from Jeremy Filosa was brought to their attention and that they have no involvement in this whatsoever. Um, 
if that can't happen because of leak policies or anything else, I'd love for the leak to come out and basically say, elaborate a little bit more. Uh, I find it a little bit mind boggling that a league would get very upset by you tweeting out all the hiccups of one team in 2023 and therefore you end up losing your job doing the play-by-play -play of another team of which you did so incredibly professionally and incredibly impeccably and um and that's that i'd also like and we're going to end it now i know your time is precious and you're pretty tired of doing this maybe in the last uh, 24 to 36 hours i'm also going to say this yes i'm biased jeremy's my friend and for me loyalty goes a long way yes i'm biased because in my closest circle of friends i consider jeremy to be in that circle that doesn't take away from the fact that the coverage that jeremy has given cf montreal soccer fans in montreal and soccer fans in quebec has been by far the best soccer coverage in the history of covering soccer this province has ever known ever and jeremy just so you know how much you're appreciated by the soccer community and how much you're loved 678,000 people read your tweet. When CF Montreal had their year-end press conference a couple of days ago, which is one of their biggest nights in their entire season, where the fan base wants to know and wants to know and wants to know and wants to know, they had 43,000 views to that tweet. Probably... Listen. The club's last 100 tweets hasn't generated 678,000 views. And I'm not saying that to embarrass the club. I'm saying A, because it's true, and B, because I'm trying to let people have an idea of how much you mean to soccer that in their eyes, in what tweet, in one tweet that you sent out is more important and has garnered more attention than the last hundred tweets from the only pro club in the city. It's pretty telling, I think. Listen, Tony, um, I want to take a, a minute here since I'm with you. And I know I've shared this on social media, but I think it's important to mention. You know, when I, when I made the announcement, um, I wasn't expecting this to become uh, news. I wasn't expecting for so many people to see it. But I've had so many messages, oh, not only the messages oh, on that tweet, but DMs on every possible platform that you can imagine from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And I have answered every single one to thank them for their support. Um, friends, obviously. Um, fans. Some big fans. Some not so big fans, but still listen, still paid attention. Um, politicians of in, here in Quebec, media members, colleagues from Quebec, from Canada, from the United States. A lot of the players on the team, the current team, wrote to me. A lot of former players, former coaches, uh, members of the Canadian national team sent me messages. Um, Members of the, the high uh, standard standings of the Montreal Canadiens and Montreal Alouettes reached out to me in support. So, Tony, I, I, I was completely overwhelmed by the love that I received. Uh, sometimes we work and we don't know, we don't realize how many people are listening or how many people like what we're doing. We think they like, but we're not sure. Um, but sometimes you put yourself, you know, you, you doubt yourself and you say, you know, did I say, um, should I not have said this? Should I not have spoken about this subject? Should I have let this one go? And I think the messages, the overwhelming messages that I got uh, were from people that thought that I was fair. Tough, yes. 
I, I have to say it, I will never deny it, but fair. And I think a league in general is better served when reporters call it like it is. And, you know, I think maybe if the league were to look at what's going on in Montreal, they'd say, well, maybe we got to deal with some of these issues instead of dealing with the people that are saying it publicly. But Jeremy, that's uh, my opinion. Listen, I, I yeah. still hope I still hope that there's a way for us to sit down to make cooler heads prevail because like I said, all I want is my job back. That's all I want. And I want to I wanna do play-by-play -play and I want to excite people about and everything that's going on in the MLS and on uh, Apple TV and uh, MLS Season Pass platform. Uh, yeah, right now it's just uh, so tough. I'm distraught. I don't know what else to say. Jeremy, I hope you get your job back. Larry Brooks has held on to his job at the New York Post, and he's had some run-ins with um, officials, executives, coaches, and um, and uh, he's very critical, but um, he cares uh, he cares about the team, he cares about their players, and he cares about hockey in that city. And, um, you know, um, I hope you do. Uh, but just know that either way, and I know you've, decided to put an end to soccer coverage in terms of podcasting um i would love for you guys to come back with imfc radio i really would uh but if you choose not to just please know that there will always be a spot for you here on the sick podcast cf montreal talk and if you um called me in 10 minutes and you said tony uh, i want to do this full time me and you uh co-hosting um uh, i would tell you yes in yeah. half a second Okay. Listen, you know, Tony, uh, I love working with you, and um, you know, I think we would do a we would make a great team doing that together. But on the other hand, uh, it's time for me to think of me. Um, it I, I know it's 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 hard for people to understand, but it hasn't been easy um, covering this team all these years. It's been a lot of heartache on their side, obviously. I'm guessing, but on my side too. And, um, you know, I've spoken to a lot of reporters who left the beat these last couple of years. And, you know, they tell me that at the end of the day, it was probably for the best um, for their own personal lives. So hopefully it'll be uh, the same for me. I know this was hard for you, and I feel even more guilty now because I kept you on longer than you would have liked to have been on. Thank you, Jeremy. We'll talk soon. There you have it, Jeremy Filosa. On that note, we bring in, uh, I'm sure that wasn't easy for Jeremy. I mean, it wasn't easy for me, and he's the one who's going through it, so you can imagine. Let's bring on former Impact player, former Impact coach, former Impact sporting director, <laughs> and head of international business relations, Nick DeSantis. Hi, Nick. Hey, Tony. Too many titles there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, a lot of titles means a lot of money, Nick. Look at the website. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That I can guarantee no. you not. <laughs> uh, I have a smile on my face. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you know, you're in your early 50s, Nick, and you're retired. I would imagine you did okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but good for you, Nick. Um, Nick, uh, you've been at those year-end pressers. And, um, you know, you were with the club for a long time. And Jeremy's a guy that asks tough questions and is very demanding at the club and you know i don't know if you ever had a picture of jeremy up in your office with uh uh and would throw a couple of darts at it every now and then but it was not always easy to deal with them but uh what can you say about what's transpired and what you've heard and yeah so you know with jeremy like like you just said uh when i was you know with the club, it's only normal that, you know, when there's, there's, I guess, criticism or negative feedback, yes, uh, you know, it, it, it hurts, but that's part of the game. And, and for me, you know, over the years, what you try to do, like anything else, like a relationship, as time goes on, you start trying to figure out, you know, the people in the media and their commitment towards their job, their commitment towards the team, 
Um, you know, and over the years with Jeremy, you know, there's been highs, been lows, uh, but in the end, I've always tried to gauge how much commitment, how much passion, you know, his yeah. voice promoting the team, the club, the sport. And I think that's something that you can't take away from him. I think that he's committed himself to this club, um, to the sport, and tried to put it out there every day. And like you said, you know, I've never, during my time, in terms of my latter years, the media we had behind the team was, was incredible. And a lot of times, it was negative. A lot of times, on a personal note, was hard on me. But that's what I chose to do. And you got to deal with that stuff. And, and that's, at times, that's the most frustrating thing, sorry, is, is that, you know, now it seems like every little negativity, it's almost like you can't deal with it. And, and that's something that, you know, to me is not understandable. Um, with Jeremy, it's, it, it hurts because, you know, in the end, we've gotten closer um, with ex-players and whatnot. And, you know, you can see that it's true loyalty to the sport and to the club. And I can assure you that all he wanted was the best for the club. Now, speaking the truth at times is not always the best. And this is why, you know, today he's, I guess, paying for that. But he did his job in terms of what he stood for. And, and that's giving news, whether it's negative or, or, or positive, but giving the truth. So that's what's, you know, it's hurtful. And I know what he's going through. Uh, but, you know, I, I want to, I did congratulate him and I'll congratulate him again on what he's done. He's left, I think, a legacy too, because he was there even through the tough times of yeah. soccer in Montreal. And he's been there through the good ones. And, you know, in the end, he's one of the builders as well. And he's got to be proud of that. Jeremy is uh, one of those uh, guys, reporters, journalists that works for the fans and doesn't work for the club. And there's not too many of those left. Uh, having said that, I will say this. I do want to give props to several members of the media that we've seen over the last 24 to 36 hours uh, that have showed um, uh, with messages of support for Jeremy, uh, which, is, which has been nice to see because some of them could have chickened out or just minded their own business. And they chose not to do so. And it's important for us in the media, especially in the sports media, which is less in numbers than ever before, to be able to stick together, to be tight, and to continue to push for freedom of speech. Um, Nick, well said. Thank you for that. Um, I, I'm just, um, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm... I'm a little bit rattled by it. I heard what you had to say. Sometimes it was negative. Sometimes it was positive. And I'll just finish with this, Nick. Sometimes the reality is negative too. And as members of the media, we can't pretend to be positive if the reality is negative. Now, back when you were there, if memory serves me well, I could be wrong by a year or two here. But I believe at one point the team missed the playoffs four or five years in a row and probably had four coaches during that span. What do you want us members of the media to say? To go on to say that everything's great? Pretty hard to do that. Right? Mm -hmm. So, anyway. did uh, I know you had a chance to see the year-end presser. Yeah, I did get most of it. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was really something. Let's backtrack here. A team that missed the playoffs, missed the play-in by two points, we're in a play-in spot for the last couple of months and finished the season with one win, five losses, and three ties. Ended up losing a game in Columbus where the second they fell behind 2-1, all the urgency in their play was over. The Red Bulls end up scoring at the last minute. But Olivier Renard, who was open in the press conference, and I really liked the way he approached it, uh, he didn't hide. He, he said a lot of things and admitted a lot of things. And he said he didn't like the way the team played. He didn't like the style of play. 
they tried to get somewhat close to it by the end of the year, but it was still nowhere close. He needs to find out why. He needs to ask those questions. And even if they would have made the playoffs, he wouldn't have been happy with it. So now the guy who really started off the press conference was Victor Wanyama, who was benched or came off the bench, part of me, was not a starter for 10 of the last 11 games. Let's bring up two clips from Wanyama, and then, Nick, I'd love to get your reaction. Victor, uh, even before El Nan was hired to coach here, there were reports when he was in D.C. that he had some problems communicating with his players. Um, would you say that was an issue here in general? Uh, talk about your case in specific, but in general, from what you observed, would you say there was some communication problem between the coach and the players? Oh, yeah? D.C. was like that? <laughs> Yeah, for, for me, with me, I think it was the same, you know. Um, I think uh, I think it's the same problem then. I think, yeah, it was like that and communication wasn't clear. And, you know, uh, I don't know, you know, and you, maybe you have, maybe you have it. I don't know what, what I can say about that, but I think the communication wasn't clear. Uh, uh, first of all, I'm here not because of him. I'm here because, you know, uh, I think I'm a good fit for, for, for the club. And also, um, the Montreal way, you know, they build the Montreal way, how we play. Uh, we had a big, a big success um, last two years. And uh, that's what we used to, uh, to know. And uh, uh, me and Rudy, so many times we had the meeting in the office about that, but also discussion between among us. Uh, but you know, then at, after that we don't have control of anything. We can't decide. You know, everybody decide. Uh, uh, the person who decides uh, the final, uh, the, the person who makes the final decision, uh, he made what he made, and uh, we didn't have any. We didn't have um, our opinions didn't matter. Uh, I'll put it out. Just last one, just to be clear, is there a way back from here with your new coach? As I said, you know, I have contract here with Chief Montreal and not with him. So um, I'll be back here, uh, I guess, and uh, we see what happens. So we we'll see. All right, once again, I'm live on uh, location at uh, Playground Poker in Ganawage. The WPT Global October Millions event is taking place. The place is absolutely packed. The tournament goes on until Monday. Uh, all the video clips that you're going to be seeing, obviously, was of CF Montreal's year-end presser. They had the clips on Facebook or the entire presser on Facebook and on Twitter. We have taken the clips off of Twitter, and those are the clips that we are showing right now and we are using. Nick, you hear your only DP of your team paid $1.8 million. A guy who's had a very long, very extremely credible and respectable career, who was on the bench or came off the bench in 10 of his last 11, say, oh, yeah, those communication problems you heard from D.C., yeah, we saw them here, too. And then says, our opinions didn't matter to him. And then says, uh, I'm not here for him. I'm here for the team. And I got to be back next year with him. So be it. Your thoughts? Yeah. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's hard to gauge because, you know, I respect Victor Wanyama a lot. Just like you said, in terms of what he's done and what he's shown when he came to Montreal. Uh, you know, through talks with friends of mine as well, saying that he's a great guy, he's a good team player, um, he leaves everything on the field. So, you know, that, when you think of it and, and you, know, you know, you see what went on this year, you know, you ask yourself, and again, we're on the outside and we don't know every detail that's going inside with the communication, with the coach, with the club, with himself, you know, we have to understand too that Victor is in the latter years of his career. Uh, you know, Victor from the first year to this year probably slowed down a little as well, which is only normal. Did that have to play with it as well with the coach saying, well, you know, uh, the way we want to play and the way we want to close spaces and the way we want to pressure, I need young, dynamic guys. I don't know. 
the only thing is is that when you go and 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 put out dirty laundry publicly then something's broken so there it's clear that that's broken with the coach uh, he has another year of contract so again these are the signs for me that give me an indication of what's that going to look like next year if both are back together uh, i don't know and this is why at times sometimes when you do public stuff and you know with all of the things that you know are said internally certain things should stay internally and the way this presser went there's a lot of things that came out publicly that shouldn't be done that way so you know again it's it's for me it's it's really really hard to think that the coach would be back when i'm listening to stuff like this um here's the coach's answer to victor wanyama i think you could feel very very easily uh who had a good season and who performed uh, and who didn't perform uh, it's it's like that it's a collective uh, game but it's also uh, in your individual position you have obligations there are not the same obligations for uh, a young player who is in his first year as a professional than than a player where the expectations are a lot uh, higher so uh, all the comments i hear them all are quite normal and you can perfectly understand uh, who had a good season and was satisfied about the season even though we didn't achieve our main goal uh, and who wasn't now uh, when we're talking about a, a, a lack of c communication I can I can be very clear with you. I had conversations with uh, witness where I was very clear, very clear with everyone. Not only yesterday when we gave our individual programs about the off season, and we did kind of a wrap up of the season individually, uh, having a, a good feedback, an honest feedback, but also through the years many different times we had meetings uh, with them and sometimes it's very hard to accept um, that a young guy a young guy is just better than you all right uh, there you have it nick uh, you just heard the coach basically telling victor wanyama victor i know you tried to throw me under the bus my friend but here's the deal uh nathan salib is better than you that's basically quote unquote that's basically what he's telling him okay you said something before that the style of play maybe didn't suit Victor. I agree with you. It didn't. But the style of play that Victor wanted to suit, that suits Victor, is the style of Victor, is the style of play that they played a year ago or two years ago under Wilfred Nancy in the last couple of years. That's the style that brought them success. That's the style that Victor wanted to play. Yeah. But and he let Losada know at one point. Tony, the season, I, yeah. I understand that, but... You have to remember, too, that did Hernan Losada have Mihailovic? Did Hernan Losada have Kone? Did Hernan Losada have Kyoto well and fit all year round? Did Hernan Losada have Camacho in the back guiding in a back three? No. And in the end, a coach can only do so much. You need your horses. And today, that's the reality is that, you know, to me, I look at it saying that this coach with that roster with all due respect managed to keep them afloat managed to keep them afloat in a position where it came down to the last game now you look at their last nine and it was very very negative and you know anywhere in the world you don't win in nine games or you win one game in nine in, uh, in one game in nine games you're relegating or you're in you're in trouble and the coach is in trouble okay but you have to look at the other end of it. And it's easy to say, well, the Montreal way, that was Wilfred Nancy way with players he had, and he got the best out of them. But you cannot compare the quality of players Wilfred had that year and the quality of players that they had this year on the roster. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, okay. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Olivier Renard who talked about the coach's future, was asked about the coach's future. I was also with Hernan yesterday. I know that you are a passionate fan, and it's normal to know if someone has a head cut or not. 
Euh, moi, la seule chose que je peux vous dire, c'est que Hernan a un contrat garanti, mais ça ne veut pas dire qu'il soit ici l'année prochaine. Ça ne veut pas dire non plus qu'il va partir. Je crois que c'est important pour nous de se mettre autour de la table, de voir... Euh, vous avez vu plusieurs joueurs défiler. Je comprends ce qu'il a dit. Le joueur qui a moins joué est souvent plus critique vers le staff que le joueur qui a beaucoup joué. Il y a d'autres joueurs dans l'équipe qui ne pouvaient pas venir ici aujourd'hui ou qu'on n'a pas mis euh, pour des choix comme ça, mais je veux dire qu'il aurait été très positif sur le coach et d'autres qui auraient pu être négatifs sur le coach. Ça, c'est investir de foot. Il y avait aussi des joueurs euh, il y a 15 mois qui étaient aussi négatifs sur le coach. Mais ça, ça ne sort pas du vestiaire, ça ne sort pas de mon bureau. Mais voilà, c'est comme ça. Mais euh, je crois que c'est à nous à surtout à prendre le pouls de, de la gestion mentale de joueurs, de, de pourquoi on n'a pas joué le football qu'on voulait voir. Nick If you listen carefully to the entire press conference, and I apologize if there's a little bit of noise in the background, it's only normal, there's a poker tournament going on. It sounds like Hernan Losada is not going to be back. And if there is even a 5% chance of him coming back, he's going to come, he's going to, you know, he's going to have to do everything the organization wants and play exactly the way they want and stick to the exact philosophy because it almost sounds like listening to Olivier Renard throughout the last three or four times that he actually spoke to the media that I listened to him, it almost sounds like he interviewed Losada. He told Losada what style of play that he wanted to see. Losada told him that he would give him that, and he didn't. And Renard was wondering why he wasn't able to give it to him. But does it sound like they're separating, Nick? Listen, you never will never know what goes on in in in, in closed doors. The the talks they've had uh, about playing style, about uh, who makes the decision, you will never know. For me, what I hear overall, for me, I guess they're waiting just for a blessing from upstairs, from the board, to say we'll eat this contract and we'll bring in somebody else. Because you know he did mention he's got a year guarantee, so he's basically saying, well, you know, we don't want to get rid of another coach. We're worried about now if we do get rid of another coach, what are they going to say? Another coach in another year. So these are the things they're questioning right now. So you know, in the end, it becomes more of what are they going to say on the outside than really think of what's needed right now. And I think there's that, I, I guess, confusion of who's saying, well, we need to fire him uh, or the fact that we can't fire another coach after a year. Nick, when Olivier Renard arrived here, I think at the time you would hear from all the players at the end of the year and, and, and based on some information You know, somebody whispering in my ear told me that Renard didn't like it because it was just way too many people talking. When there's way too many people talking, obviously, it's more difficult to control the message. Not that he wanted to control it, but to control the message overall. And obviously, if you're talking to a bunch of players who know that there's absolutely no chance that they're going to come back, they're going to be feel more free to actually say what's on their mind. The fact that Wanyama, who was at odds with the coach, which I talked about here for the last three or four months, and people told me you're trying to stir up whatever, that Wanyama told Losada, we're playing the wrong style of play, we got to play another style, and people said, yeah, you know, you're just saying that, whatever. That Wanyama felt that he was punished because he tried to speak up. I was told whatever, yeah. But don't you find it odd? that a guy that was on the bench or didn't come in for 10 of the last 11 games was one of the guys chosen to be available to speak to the media. I just thought it was a little bit odd. Don't you? Yeah, you know, again, if, if you start reading into things, you can read into a lot of little things and maybe that might be it. But, you know, for me, I look into it saying that he's one of the leaders, I guess. Um, I don't know. I, it, it's, it's hard. I got another question for you. If you were know. Wanyama, I have another question for you. If you're Wanyama and you had a year left on your deal that's going to pay you $1.8 million dollars per year, would you speak as freely as you did knowing that this guy could be your coach next season? 
I don't well, know. It just sounds like yeah, he was very comfortable saying what he said. Yeah, but let's read into this now. Wanyama sure. Knows, Wanyama knows it's his final year. He knows it's guaranteed. I'm getting paid anyways. I'm going to give it a shot and see if we can get this guy out of here. Maybe there's a chance that I'm going to end up playing my last year. If that doesn't happen, I'll sit another year and make my $1.8 million, and then I'm done. So It's a great you know, answer, Nick. It's a great answer. You can look at it so many different ways. In the end, Tony, yeah, you know, I think that they they all. I thought that Hernan spoke very well at the presser because you know you did, what, yeah. That's yeah. that's what usually happens, and he's very clear. And you yeah. know, I, I don't think he's lying to to any extent. No. Uh, you know, I like, didn't like I didn't like his body language, Nick. Let me explain if I can. He came in like a defense lawyer right away. You could tell that he did not appreciate Wanyama's comments. He was sitting in basically the auditorium, taking notes of everything, listening to everything. He got up from my basement in Villa Sal. I can see the smoke coming out of his ears. He was red like a tomato, more red than me with the blood pressure that I have because I'm obese. I mean, he he was. I don't. I didn't think his body language made him look good. That's but he my said, read. But he said the right things. Okay. He did say the right things, and I think. When Olivier came on, he said the right things as well in terms of, you know, he agreed to a certain extent with players. The ones that don't play are going to be a little bit more negative, which is normal. The ones it's that true. play, they're happy because they're playing. It's so, true. You know, those are things that, to me, I think they were they were they were well said. Uh, you know, overall, the club has a decision to make, and you know, like I said, I thought that you know Hernan with what the cards he had on hand, I think that he kept the team alive for so long and kept it in a, in a hopeful spot uh with again with all due respect a team that you know you saw it against columbus it was just another level and and i think all those teams above are just yeah. another level so again you know i think that you know if they really want a better playing style and 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 for fans to to get enjoy you got to add to that roster and 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 make it more competitive and, and give it more quality. Nick, I, I want to take you back uh, to Sean Rea entering a game at the 71st oh. minute and then asked oh. to come oh. off at the 93rd minute because they wanted to kill, kill time on home field. He wasn't very happy. For those who forget what it looked like, let's bring up the clip. There you have it. It's at home in front of their fans. It's not happy. I just came on 23 minutes ago. I don't want to hear from you. Let me go to the bench. Can't believe this guy just took me off. <laughs> okay. After that, he's not in the lineup for a while. He ends up getting in at one point. I think in early July, he comes in at right wing back. Had played a game with the reserves. He didn't play for the last three and a half months of the season, Nick. August, September, October. Yeah, he didn't play for the last three and a half months of the season. Okay. And at one point, so at the end of the, 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 the year press conference, Olivia Renard says, I didn't like the fact that Sean wasn't playing a lot either. A homegrown from the academy. I, I told his agent... If you can send them on loan somewhere, I want to see this kid play. Don't send them to the CPL. He's already proven it there. Send them somewhere else. Uh, I'll pay his full salary. And he said the agent never got back to me, and he said that twice. And then he also said this about what surprised them about Rhea. Dire une chose qui m'a surprise par rapport à lui, c'est quand une fois il a déclaré. Peut-être que c'est un petit peu de naïveté de, de sa part. Quelqu'un lui a posé la question s'il n'avait pas besoin d'un grand frère à sa position. Et il a répondu oui. Donc tu demandes un concurrent à ta place. Et parfois, même quand un staff ou un club entend ça, c'est spécial parce qu'un Ismaël Kone ou un Saliba, ils ne vont pas demander un grand frère à côté. Là, si, as, si tu te sens capable de jouer, tu prends ta position, tu prends tes responsabilités. Et je crois que le club l'a déjà assez démontré que ce n'est pas une question d'âge. Si tu es prêt à jouer. Mais ce n'est pas pour ça qu'il n'a plus joué après. Mais je veux dire, là, Sean doit encore grandir à ce niveau-là, au niveau de la personnalité et de la confiance en lui, et ne pas demander une concurrence supplémentaire à sa position. Mais euh, il a énormément de qualité, et on verra dans le, dans le futur comment ça va se passer. 
All right. Um, I find it a little odd that um, quite often Olivier Renard, um, when he brings up Ishmael Kone, he brings up Nathan Saliba's name next to his and attaches it. Uh, I think it's a completely different category. But then again, he's, um, you know, say what he wants. Um, I want it so... You heard what he just said, that he was surprised by what Sean Reyes said. And obviously it bothered him because he, he took the time to bring it up in the presser. So it did. But I want to, I want to, I want you to watch that clip where Reyes had said it was actually a question by Jeremy Filosa earlier in the season. Let's play it. It's difficult to play the role that you play without having a grand frère really on the side of you who has done that for, let's say, 7, 8, 9, 10 years who can qui peut te coacher, qui peut t'aider. C'est sûr, ça serait plus facile si tu avais un, un mentor comme ça mm -hmm. qui te montre les ropes et pour te montrer. Mais après, moi, il faut que je fasse ma job. Mm -hmm. Either way, so, moi, je travaille fort, j'essaie de faire le mieux que je peux, puis on, on espère avoir des résultats bientôt. Nick, does it, does it, do you see anything wrong in the answer? Like, and, and I can't wait to hear from you because I, I have an opinion. I, Personally, I, I don't see anything wrong with the answer. I think it's a young player who is being very honest, very honest, and maybe it is naive, like Olivier Renard said. At the same time, but, you know, some of these players don't know what's right and what's wrong. It's not like they're really coached from a communications point of view. Um, but you as a former player who played with this fire burning in him but understands also the reality of having to do interviews and what to say and what not to say, did you see anything wrong in his answer? There's nothing wrong. Uh, there's inexperience. Inexperience of answering a question right away in that moment. And I think Olivier is right to a certain extent that if he had a bit more experience, his answer would be, no, I don't really need anyone. You know, the philosophy of this club is, is to promote young players. And I'm a young player and I have to take full responsibility and have the personality to deal with that. That's the way I see it. Um, you know, was there anything wrong with it? No, but I think it was an inexperienced answer. Now, mm -hmm. back to the fact of when he came off with Hernan Losada, you know, and again, I'm, you know, everyone sees things differently. For me, it was wrong because it can only hurt him and no one else. And it did hurt him. You know, you're a 21-year-old kid, right? You're getting minutes with the first team in front of 20,000 people. Yes, those moments are pretty tough, especially being a local kid. But suck it up and deal with it. Because in the end, you know, then we can follow through and go through. He didn't play. He went to the reserve team. I remember that day being with you, watching him play. And if I was someone that didn't know him i would have said that guy plays on the reserve team there's so many others like that here in montreal so those are the things that when you talk about mentors and people around you those are the things that he needs to learn those are the people he needs around him to make him understand even at that age and getting minutes you know what's important and you know going down to the reserve now all of a sudden you're not getting minutes you better be the best player out there that's the reality. And, and I think this is where I completely agree with Hernan. I completely agree with, with, uh, with, um, with uh, um, Olivier. Olivier is that these are things, they're, 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 they're experiences and, and the inexperienced yeah. certain players. Now, we can even say, Tony, that when I see the overall picture and I see a kid like Sean Rea and I see a Bryce Duke, what's the difference, you know? In the end, you know, you went to get Bryce Duke at a million dollars. I think Rhea has the same qualities, maybe a little bit more dynamic in terms of eliminating players, but they're kind of the same profiles. So, you know, like for the, the part of Rhea that is inexperienced costed him, Rhea has to understand too that he's got certain qualities. And, and you know, it's, it's, sometimes it's not about the quality of the player, it's the quality of the mindset that's going to get you further because you just started playing football soccer. It's how long can you stay out there? And these so, are things that I think they have to think about. So I agree with everything you said when he played with the reserve team. You can tell he didn't want to be there with all due respect to the kid. He didn't, and that's the wrong mindset, okay? I agree with you. 
I agree with Olivier Renard that it was a very naive answer. I wouldn't admit it bothered me as much as it seems like it bothered him, but I understand what he's saying. I agree with you saying that he's lacking experience in that moment. I agree. I agree with everything you said. And I also agree with what you just said. What's the difference between him and Bryce Duke? And add to that, Hamdi struggling and Miljevic was released. He's on he's a healthy scratch for three and a half months. The last three and a half months of the season, you went one, five, and three without him, like in the last nine games. I mean, were you better? And I'll ask the question about Wanyama too, who's a veteran. You know, you talk about the kid being better than Wanyama, and I like the kid. He's a good player. A hundred percent he is. He still had zero goals and zero assists in an entire season, and now he's taking the spot of a co-captain, a guy who's played at the highest level, and a guy who's yeah, only started in the last 11 games spot. resulted in a 1-1 tie with Cincinnati, and when he came off at the 83rd minute of play, one Yama did, and his only start in the last 11, they were winning one nothing. So... Um, so those are decisions the club has to. Those are things the club has to evaluate. Is I don't. I I will. I don't agree with Losada on anything in terms of Rea, though. And I'm gonna. I'm gonna tell you why. Based on what I've heard, the Friday before the final game, Losada grilled into Rea during the entire warm up, and I can tell you that it ticked off the team. To the point where the team said, you know, this guy has hit rock bottom. He's been a healthy scratch for the last three and a half months. You know you're not bringing him to Columbus. Why are you kicking him while he's down for? And some coaches will probably tell you it's tough love, but, you know, there's other terms that could be used for that as well. Yeah, but you, but, but you see that all over the world, Tony. And you see certain players that you know, have to ride the bench and they're not getting minutes and, you know, until that coach is gone and then all of a sudden, now he's got to think, Sean, that he's a 21, 22-year-old kid Yeah, that, you know, I think has a bright future ahead of him if his head's on straight. Now, you know, as much as it could be the coach's fault, he's got to look at himself in the mirror and start thinking of what, what he can control to get back to where he needs to be. Uh, there's certain times, and I've always, I always tell everyone, you can't control others. You can't, yeah. you can't control a coach what he's thinking. Yeah. Because he might see it a different way. What can you control? Is going every day to practice and try to, I guess, do the things you can control to maybe change his mind. That's the reality. And You're right, Nick. These are things right. young players really have to understand. Yeah, Ray has got his share of blame. In a nutshell, I'm just saying, Hernan is really an awful communicator. We heard coming out of DC United, we were the red flags were there. We were given warnings that he was like this. For whatever reason, they decided to hire him anyway. And when we brought up, they said, no, 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 don't believe everything that you're hearing coming out of DC. And then at the end of the year that we find out that the exact same way he was in DC, he was in Montreal, and everyone repeats the same things. Okay, uh, Quebec-born players. Uh, Mathieu Chouanier, Jonathan Sirois obviously had a fantastic year. I loved both of them. I thought both of them were absolutely fantastic this season for CF Montreal. Um, and Olivier Renard says this about Quebec-born players. Je suis arrivé ici. Uh, je, je reçois beaucoup de compliments quand je vois mon fils le week-end, quand je viens voir les jeunes de l'académie ici, uh, des parents qui, qui me disent, et je vous dis vraiment ce qu'on me dit, que même si je ne suis pas une personne du Québec, je fais attention aux joueurs du Québec. Euh, or que des gens avant moi qui étaient québécois ne faisaient pas attention. Donc euh, ça fait certainement plaisir de faire ça et d'entendre ça. All right, Olivier Renard, as I try and light a little bit of fuel here, a little bit. Olivier Renard could have said, people stop me all the time and they can tell me and they tell me that they're, they're very appreciative of the opportunity that I give Quebec-born players. He adds a little bit more and he says, people stop me all the time. They tell me they're very appreciative of opportunities I give Quebec-born players. More so than Quebecers who were here before me did. Ooh, I wonder who that is. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> you. Is it? <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, my God. Yeah, so, listen, in the end, you can toot your own horn, and it's nice about the Quebec players, and listen, trust me, it's great. You know, the bottom line is no one questions the real things. And the real things are, what about all the other players? What about the foreign players that came from day one? And go through them and look at the salaries they're making and see if they're justified. So, you know, again, you can look at it both ways. And, and you know, when you think of a Mathieu Chouanier, yeah, because he was under, I guess, the last generation of when the academy really started making things with Philippe Poulafoy there, all right, where you started seeing that there might be the one, two players that can come up in the rankings, all right? Did uh, we always try, you know, the Jackson MLs, you know, that scored 10 goals in MLS in a season, you know? That's not promoting a Quebec player. Like, I don't want to go there because I'm just a guy now from the outside. He's vice president. And if he feels he has to justify those things publicly, so be it. You know, I'm extremely happy for Mathieu Chouanier, for Sirwa, and for the local players. But in the end, sometimes it kind of blurs the vision of everything else, you know, to question on what went on this year and to question, you know, the reality of the team and the roster and the players that have been brought in from the outside. The Are local you players to... aren't the problem. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Okay. So, um, are you uh, are you saying that um, uh, Hamdi didn't work out, Nick, or Miljevic didn't work out, or? Well, that all depends on what minutes they were expected to play. And the Bjorn Janssens and the Kizas and the Sanusis, like the top scorers, got five goals. Is it Mathieu Chouanier? Five goals in 34 games. If you would have had one game more, it's 35. It's a goal in every seven. So let's average it out. It's a goal in every 6.75 games or so in MLS. Yeah. So, you know, again, that, those are the things that you should be questioning. If you're going to watch MLS caliber games and you're looking at, you know, a guy, your top scorer's got five goals, I think it's pretty concerning. Nick, where do we go from here? Well, listen, I think that, you know, the first and most important thing is, I guess, they have to make their decision on uh, on the coach. Uh, and then, like I said, I before the little games I've watched, you know, the roster's not good enough. It's just not, you know, and, you know, you can question the budgets that they're given. But, you know, when you're looking at salaries, I think the salaries came out and you go through some of those players' salaries and try to justify those salaries with the minutes they've played, who's questioning that? Nick DeSantis, always not shy to give his opinions. All heart when he played, all heart now in semi-retirement. <laughs> Thanks, Nick, for taking the time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Tony. All right, there you have it. Nick DeSantis, Marinaro. I hope you enjoyed this most recent edition here of the SICK Podcast, CF Montreal Talk. I am live at Playground Poker doing this for the very first time. I hope not the last because I'm really honest when I tell you that we really feel at home here. Come to Playground once and you'll be hooked. Trust me when I tell you that. The WPT Global October Millions Event Poker Tournament is taking place right now with so many familiar faces here. It's nice to see everybody. It goes on until Monday. Thank you all for watching. Follow us on YouTube. It's absolutely free to follow. Thank you to Nick DeSantis. Thank you to Jeremy Filosa. And follow us on our Twitter handle, at SickPod, CFMTL. For Agnello, Sammy, and Juliana, here at Playground Poker, they're Cavallaro. I'm Marinaro. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the sick podcast, CF Montreal Talk on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.